Since the release of Engage, there's been a lot of discourse in the Fire Emblem community on gameplay versus story in the series, and I thought I'd weigh in with my opinions. I found a feature on Tier List Maker called Alignment Chart, and I've used it to create two axes, story and gameplay, and I'm going to be ranking all the Fire Emblems on where I place them on these axes. Again, disclaimer, this is entirely my subjective opinion and you are very welcome to disagree. Let's start with Fire Emblem 1, and I'm going to be rating gameplay first. Disclaimer though, Fire Emblem 1 is the only game on this list that I have not actually played. But I have opinions on its gameplay, and so I rank its gameplay about... here, I think. Some of them might be shuffled around uh, for better visibility as I rank more games. So, Fire Emblem 1 has some very, very janky gameplay. You can't view enemy attack ranges, weapons are incredibly unbalanced, some classes can't even promote even though their promotions exist, like particularly Hunter and Armor Knight. Healers need to get attacked to gain experience, the convoy mechanic is weird. Characters gain the exact same experience regardless of their level, so pre-promotes level up just as fast as, as level 1 unpromoted characters. The thing is though, it's hard to fault a lot of this too much because this was one of the first strategy RPGs ever made. So for starting a whole genre, it's really not that bad, but by the series standards, things have improved a lot since then. As for story, I'm going to leave it where it is, right on the middle. This game to me is literally the baseline to which every other Fire Emblem story is compared. Yes, it's simple, and most characters don't say anything unless they die, but for its time, it was actually pretty revolutionary. Not a lot of games were trying to tell big epic war stories, so this is where Fire Emblem 1 is going to sit. Next up, I am going to be treating Gaiden and Echoes the same because they're similar enough, though the Arcanea remakes will be treated differently. So, for gameplay, I rank Echoes and Gaiden... Oh, I'm going to piss off a lot of people by doing this. Uh, yeah, about here. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll put the story um just on the average uh, for now. So, okay, let me explain. The map design in Gaiden is extremely archaic, and they clearly didn't really think it through that well. Most maps either have tons of empty space, or are entirely full of irritating terrain like desert and swamp. The enemy variety is also awful, it's almost all cavaliers most of the time you're fighting human enemies, and while the monsters are kinda cool, they also have their issues. Another problem I have is you only need one more speed than the enemy to double, and this was retained in the remake, unlike the Arcanea games. This makes enemies like gargoyles irritatingly durable because they're really hard to double, and you fight them in large numbers and they have high defense. This game admittedly was pretty revolutionary in terms of RPG mechanics in the series, and its world map and skirmishes were used a lot later down the line, and dungeons were pretty cool too, especially in third person in the remake. I'm gonna knock this game some more gameplay points for something that might sound petty, but a lot of the RPG elements don't appeal to me because you level up so slowly in Echoes. Part of the joy of Fire Emblem is, to me, is watching my characters level up and gain stats, and when your experience bar fills up this slowly, I get that dopamine rush so rarely in Gaiden and Echoes. Oh yeah, not to mention the fact that indoor maps, that some maps have indoor tiles where every single tile gives plus 20 evasion, which just reduces combats to annoying missing fights. That's another thing I find about Echoes as well, it seems like both you and the enemies just take forever to die, and a lot of combats consist of ineffectually flailing at each other for minimal damage. So that's the gameplay, but for story, this one's definitely going to be higher up there, maybe about here. The main reason for this is less the overall story to me, and more the presentation. 
Not only does this game look gorgeous, but every single line is fully voiced. When I heard that they do that in pre-release, I didn't believe them, but it was true. And Gaiden's characters went from the most forgettable in the series to me, to some of my favourites, entirely because of this. There are supports, I will admittedly knock this a little bit for there not being enough supports, some characters really should have got more of them, like for example, I don't think Claire and Clive can support at all. And what supports there are are quite short, but some of them are kind of decent. The presentation really carries this though, especially you being able to talk to your characters in town. The reason why this isn't quite at the top is for the plot itself, and this is mostly an Echoes issue. I'm not a fan of a lot of the changes that they made to the original story in the remake. Namely, the Witch Selica subplot, which goes nowhere and only exists to create a pointless in Midias Res opening, and the way Miller and Duma are portrayed in the game's story. I'm not against them being dragons, but the fact they blame all their problems on dragon degeneration was the start of an issue with, I like to call, anti-dragon racism that the series had at this point, and it continued into some of the later games. What sums up my issues is that Norma's ending still says he united the faiths of Mila and Duma, when that's kind of incompatible with the direction the story goes in the remake. I will admit though, Rudolph's motivations were conveyed much better than they were in the original, and Bakut is a pretty good villain. Fernand is kinda air though. So overall, that drags Echoes down from the very peak of story to me. Next up is Mystery of the Emblem. So for gameplay, I rank Mystery of the Emblem, uh, yeah, I'll put it about here in gameplay. Mystery of the Emblem is where I feel the franchise really hit its stride. You can actually view enemy attack ranges now, and while weapons are a, still a little imbalanced, ahem, <clears throat> axes not even existing in Book 2, Overall, I felt like this was much closer to modern Fire Emblem in terms of gameplay. The maps are pretty good, and one of the biggest things this game has going for it is the sheer length of it. Even though they cut five chapters from the original, you still get both Book 1 and 2, and each of them are 20 chapters long, making this one of the longest games in the series in chapter count. The Star Sphere Shards are also a very fun mechanic, especially as it lets every character be very customizable, and even some of the weaker ones can become viable with enough shards. Mystery of the Emblem is THE Fire Emblem game in Japan, and it outsold most of the rest of the games for a very long time, and I think that's for good reason. Story-wise, I rank Mystery a little above the original, but not like all the way. It's still very simple, and they did cut out five chapters from the original Fire Emblem 1 story, which I'm glad were restored in Shadow Dragon, as some of those five chapters have interesting developments. The main reason this is a little higher is, I like the angle they had with Hardin in Book 2. He was kind of the series' first, like, tragic Emperor character, and some might not like that he was brainwashed all along, but the tragedy factor of one of Marth's old allies becoming one of his greatest foes adds a little bit more depth to the story that Book 1 lacked. I will say though, Medius and Garnef got way less interesting, and this is about the point where they started turning Medius from a mundane dictator who just happened to be a dragon to literally evil incarnate. Of course, there are no supports in this game, and much of the characters' backstories had to be fleshed out through Kaga's notes, like Ogma's past as a gladiator, or Castor's incredibly tragic backstory. Look that up if you haven't already. Uh, you don't get that out of Shadow Dragon. But that's about where I put Mystery of the Emblem, and now, oh boy, this is going to be an interesting one, Genealogy of the Holy War. So... I really enjoy this game, but it's hard to rank it because objectively I do have some problems with its gameplay. I think in the end, it's gonna go right in the middle of the good to bad gameplay axis. So Genealogy is a bit of a weird Fire Emblem game. 
It's almost an open world Fire Emblem with its massive maps. The problem is those are both a blessing and a curse. They add an epic feel to things, and there is still a sense of urgency in terms of secondary objectives like villages. The problem is it does invalidate a lot of characters who aren't on horses, and I'm biased here because my favourite Gen 1 characters are Lewin and Ira, so, uh, yeah. I do also have to knock this one for the weapon balance, because magic is very weird. This was the first game that used, like, a magic triangle, but wind was objectively superior to everything else in terms of stats, and fire was objectively the worst. Thinking about it, this was the first game to add the weapon triangle, so that was a good step forward for the series. The weapon ranks were entirely dictated by class and crusader blood. The Holy Blood system though was interesting, and the second gen system was very customizable and added a bit of replay value. The downside is that for a blind player it's not foreshadowed very well, or at least the foreshadowing is hard to pick up unless you know what's coming. And unlike, for example, Awakening, some pairings are just not worth doing at all, like Lewin and any physical user, while others are better. But still, every character has like three to five viable pairings, and that's already a decent amount of replay value. Now for story, and this is where, yep, Genealogy is going to be my first game that goes all the way up to the top for story. Genealogy was kind of the series' first attempt at a real grounded political drama, and I think it worked extremely well. The first half is practically a Shakespearean tragedy, with its very flawed protagonist who ends up bringing about their own downfall and unwittingly making the world a lot worse, while the second half reconstructs things with a more idealistic protagonist who goes on to fix their father's messes. Also, the characters stand out to me as some of the most memorable in the whole series, despite the lack of a true support system. This might be because of the smaller cast, and the gameplay allowing you to deploy everyone, and they really encourage you to train every character, especially with the arena. My only gripe is that only three pairings per character get actual dialogue. This will probably be fixed if there's ever a remake. But it is very surprising just how endearing this cast is to me, both the heroes and the villains. Even some of the minor enemy nobles I find very memorable. So yeah, well done Genealogy, you've earned a top spot. Next is Thracia. Now this one's a little weird because I have played Thracia, but only once, and I never actually finished it. I did get almost to the end though. So this rank is going to be a bit of theory crafting on how I'll probably view it if I were to play it today. And for gameplay, that would be about here. Thracia, and this is a little underappreciated I find, is the Fire Emblem that all modern Fire Emblem takes after. Despite it being the last Kaka game, this one laid the groundwork for the future of the series gameplay. If you've played the Game Boy Advance Fire Emblems, Thracia will be surprisingly familiar to you, although it does have a little bit of early jank and some other mechanics that aren't in those. But things like Fog of War, varied objectives besides seizing, trading items between allies, lessed weapon ranks that go up when you use weapons, rescuing, it pretty much all debuted here. But like I said, there's still a little bit of jank. Status ailments never wear off unless you use an item to cure them. The capturing mechanic is really fun, but there are some awkward elements to it, like the fact that if an enemy so much as touches one of your healers, you lose all their styles because they've been captured. And some game mechanics, particularly the way the escape objective works, are not explained very well to the player and horribly punishing if you don't know how they work via a guide. Speaking of punishing, I consider Thracia's difficulty overrated. Yeah, it's got a lot of tough moments, and the cast aren't like totally invincible, but you can make anybody super strong with Crusader Scrolls. There's a lot of decently powerful characters, and there's only a few outlier chapters, but those outliers are so brutal they make the game look a lot harder by proxy. Mostly the Reinhardt chapter, and especially 24X, that was where I quit my first playthrough. It says something that the fan translation created new dialogue just to explain the gimmick of 24X, because it would have been unfair otherwise. I also really like the fatigue system. 
it incentivizes you to use a lot of characters rather than soloing the game with one person, but with the existence of stamina drinks and the roster of characters, all of which are pretty decent, it doesn't really feel that punishing. And now story. This one is gonna go decently high, honestly, for me. So here's the thing with Thracia. A lot of stories are about a plucky band of rebels going up against an evil empire. Thracia is one of the few stories of that kind that actually feels like it. You are horribly outmatched, and the gameplay conveys this too. You're forced to scavenge weapons from captured foes to survive. Speaking of capturing, the mechanic adds a lot of depth to boss fights, because it is possible to spare the lives of more sympathetic bosses by capturing them. It doesn't really affect the plot, but it feels like a nice thing to do. For example, one of the early game bandits says he's going to turn his life around and become a fisherman if you do this. Leaf also and his advisors are pretty decent characters. Augustus as well is somebody who I feel I'd have new appreciation for if I look back. He's almost a proto Soren in his pragmatism, though he's less of a jerk. My main issue with this game story-wise is, without a support system and with a pretty large cast unlike Genealogy, its characters are some of the least memorable in the franchise, and that seems to reflect in the Choose Your Heroes polls as well. This is a game that could definitely use a remake with a support system. If it did, I'm pretty sure its cast might become as good as Echo's. So now we're on to the post-Kaga era, and the first truly modern Fire Emblem game, and the last Japan-only one. And this is going to be interesting, because back when I was younger, I would have put FE6 all the way down here. Now, I actually rank FE6 around here on gameplay. A replay a few years ago drastically changed my opinion on this game, especially after playing some of the other GBA games alongside it. Fire Emblem 6 is way more well designed than I thought it was. This is a game that goes for quality over quantity in enemy composition. You need to make sure that you are using the right character for the right enemy, and if you don't, people will die. Weapons are also much more balanced than the other GBA games due to this. This is the only GBA game where swords are good and javelins and hand axes aren't broken. The janky hit rates, honestly, I'm okay with them because they go some effort to giving swords a real niche because they're the only weapons you have reliable accuracy with. Though there is the issue that sometimes lances with weapon triangle advantage have less hit rates than swords with weapon triangle disadvantage. That shouldn't be a thing. They were still figuring out the weapon triangle modifiers. The characters are also a lot more balanced than I expected. The outliers like Gwendolyn and Sophia really stand out, but the overpowered characters like Melody and Percival don't join until mid-game. Marcus is one of the few balanced Jagans in the series. He does his job perfectly well, weakening enemies in the early game without killing them, and he does drop off, at least on hard mode. And while Rutger is powerful and joins early, he's in a class that isn't traditionally good, so I'm okay with that. Possibly my favourite unit design in this game, and this might be a bit of a hot take, is Fear. Yeah, she joins a little late and very underleveled, but she's a sword user who starts with a high crit sword and joins right in the middle of a very axe-heavy portion of the game. Also, her join chapter has pirate reinforcements she can easily grind experience off of, and if you train her, Swordmaster is a good class in FE6, and promoting her gets her a plus 30 crit bonus, which is very much worth it. The Axe Heavy Arc is another thing, FE6 really balances the enemy composition much better than the other GBA games do. Axes are still relevant on enemies, even past the early game, and bow users on your side are somewhat decent because Wyvern Lords are really dangerous, and enemies are powerful enough that ranged chip damage without counterattacks is valuable. I suppose if I would have any gripes here, it would be that some of the Gaiden chapters have really dumb gimmicks. Some weapons like the Tomahawk and Rune Sword are enemy only for no real reason. And some chapters are way too heavy on status staves, particularly Berserk. But overall, Fire Emblem 6 is a game that redeemed itself for me a lot in the gameplay department. 
as for story, it only slightly redeemed itself, and unfortunately, I'm gonna have to give FE6 my first below average story rating. But I can only really put it about here. So, here's the thing. I fully admit most of my issues with FE6's story are biased from starting with FE7. I love the world of Elib as portrayed in FE7, and FE6's Elib does not even feel like the same setting. Now again, this is unfair because FE7 was made later, but I can't deny that playing it first coloured my perception. So here's how I view Elib in FE6. Every nation is ruled by cartoon villains who sell out their country to burn because of greed, fear, or both. It's a very cynical portrayal of humanity, and it kind of works given that Zephiel's whole motivation and his ideological conflict with Roy, but for the Alib that I grew attached to in FE7, it just kind of hurts to see it like that. The details we get on the scouring are good, but they're all exposition dumped on you in the span of one chapter, which gets very exhausting. These issues are exasperated by the characters. So firstly, a lot of the party members in FE6 are decent characters with good supports. The problem is it's really hard to see this because this was the first game to use the modern support system, and it shows. Many characters need as many as 200 turns of being adjacent to reach an A rank, and there's a hard cap of I think 120 support points gained per chapter across your whole army. So not even ending your turn 50 times at the end of a chapter will help. But even without supports, the main story is just the Roy and Merlin show, occasionally featuring Guinevere, Nime, and Yoda. And Roy and Merlinus are not good characters in the main story. Roy is good in support, and that's what's most frustrating to me. Because none of that depth of character is shown in the main story, where his whole shtick is just being nice to people. Meanwhile, Merlinus is just an annoying, grumpy old man who exists to provide exposition. Later Fire Emblems had more characters chiming in in the main story to make these issues less noticeable, and among the antagonists, Zephiel and a couple of the Wyvern generals are the only remotely interesting ones. Like in particular, Rorats and Alcard, or whatever they're called in the modern fan translation, these two are the main villains all the way from the Western Isles arc to the Ilya slash Sakai arc, and both of them are boring as crap. And I will stress, Zephiel is a good villain, and Idun is a really, really creative and interesting final boss, but neither of them have as much screen time as boring generic villains. So in the end, that's where I rank Fire Emblem 6, but it is a game that redeemed itself to me, and I do think a remake could fix a lot of my story issue. And now on to Fire Emblem 7 The Blazing Blade, my first game in the series. So gameplay-wise, I'm gonna rank this one right on the end of the bad gameplay scale. Now, here's the thing. If this is your first Fire Emblem, or if you're otherwise new to the series, FE7 is a fantastic game. The reason why I rank it this low is that once you are familiar enough with the series to understand how weak the enemies are, suddenly this game falls apart a lot. So here's the thing. Enemies are so weak and are weighed down by their weapons that Marcus can solo almost the whole game on his base stats alone. And this one fact ruins a lot of the appeal of Fire Emblem to, to me. Back when I was a kid, I would replay this game over and over using a different party every time. Now, knowing that Marcus invalidates so much of the cast if you're playing efficiently, and that javelins and hand axes are just broken because you can just park a paladin with one of those somewhere and then watch 50 enemies run into them and die, and that characters like Lin are nearly worthless because their speed is overkill, you only need like 11 or 12 to double everything relevant, it hurts a lot of the game's appeal to me. It's funny how this game runs on the same engine as FE6, and refines a lot of the jankier aspects of FE6, but the sheer lack of enemy quality just detracts from it so much. 
I do personally enjoy the side quest system though, and I do like what Hector Mode does for the game. Unlike other games that reuse maps, <coughs> Fire Emblem Three Houses, they actually make an effort to vary up the enemy variety and the starting positions of your army in Hector Mode, to the point where some maps feel very different. And in Hector Hard Mode, they do weird gimmicky things like making every enemy a mage, or giving every enemy a reaver weapon. It can be hit and miss, but it does make replays a lot more interesting. And this is all in one cartridge too. As for story, okay, this is gonna be a little bit of a controversial take to some people. I'm gonna put FE7's story in the slightly above average category. I don't hate this story with a venomous passion, like a lot of Fire Emblem fans do now. I've seen some of their videos, and the only part of them that I really agree with is Ephidel being a lame villain. Overall, I think FE7's story is fine what it is, and I like how it's trying a more small-scale plot rather than a big continent-spanning war. But this story is really carried by the characters. I'm biased because this was my first game, but FE7's cast really endeared themselves to me, and they are still among my favourites. Lynn Aylwood and Hector are all great. Yeah, Lynn's not that relevant outside of her story, but her contributions to conversations with Aylwood and Hector are still nice. The rest of the cast is also very memorable. They've got a lot of good supports, and even their story moments, as brief as they are, are pretty solid. And while Nurgle isn't a great villain, the Four Fangs and his chief morphs definitely are. Except, again, Everdell. So, yeah, really nice characters and okay story. That's how I rank FE7. And now, Sacred Stones. This one might also be a little bit of a hot take. I'm gonna rank this... here, on the gameplay scale. Even though it suffers from a lot of the same problems that FE7 does, namely, very easy enemies. And yes, Seth is stupidly broken, but if you're avoiding using him, I find there's a decent number of viable characters in Sacred Stones, and again, this is a hot take, I do really enjoy the trainee. I know that objective tier list debates have to assume you're not using the Tower of Valny, but I feel like the trainees are designed expecting that you grind them to promotion there, and if you do, they are very fun to use with the sheer number of promotion paths they can go through. This game introduced branching promotions, and overall it added a lot of fun customization and replay value, even though some promotion paths were better than others. It's hard to describe why I enjoy this game more than I do FE7, but the map design, I feel, is really good for such an easy game. Also, there are skirmishes in a world map, but it doesn't really impact my enjoyment of this game that much. It mostly derives from the map design, and just how fun a lot of the characters are to use. And as for story... Ah, uh, this is gonna overlap Thrace here a little bit, but I'm actually gonna rank... Uh, I'm going to rank Sacred Stones pretty high up there. So, Sacred Stones' story is simple, but it's deceptively simple. There's a lot of complicated politics going on behind the scenes, and it has one of the best overall villains in the franchise. The cast of characters are also great. I rank them even above FE7s. There's not many of them, but it means that every character who joins feels like they have a reason to be there, and all of them have very solid supports, and the post-game lets you grind for support you missed in the main story, letting you witness all the developments. There's a really great variety of relationships among the cast too. You've got romances like Erica and Seth, and Ephraim and Tana, along with their other options, but you also have some really nice platonic relationships, like Amelia and Dussel, him acting as a bit of a substitute parent for her. Sacred Stones also has possibly my favourite root split in the series. Erica and Ephraim split into two distinct roots of five chapters halfway through the game. These roots are different enough as to add replay value, but not so different as to radically alter the story and stretch the writing team too thin. The only reason I don't put Sacred Stones at the top of story is there are others whose stories I like more. Speaking of which, the next game on the list is Path of Radiance, and for gameplay I'm going to put Path of Radiance, uh, maybe a little higher than Mystery of the Emblem. Path of Radiance is an interesting beast because its gameplay is also very easy. There is a maniac 
difficulty exclusive to the Japanese version, but it's more tedious than actually hard. And there is a bit of weird class imbalance. Foot sword locked units aren't great, and paladins are kind of overpowered. Also, the party eclipses enemies very quickly in Path of Radiance because all of the characters who join you have really good growth rates. But it is a very fun game to mess around in, I find. It's kind of hard for me to describe why I like it more than FE7, even though they have kind of similar flaws. But it's another of those games that I enjoy replaying and using different characters. But Path of Radiance has some gameplay mechanics that I like way more than many other games in the franchise. I just can't rank it as high as them because the overall map design isn't as good. The first is the base system, which is a precursor to systems like My Castle and the Monastery, but I actually think the base system is better than any of those. It's just a menu, so it doesn't really overstay its welcome, but the base does something incredible that future Fire Emblems should do. Base conversations. One day I might make an entire video about how base conversations are amazing and solve most of the franchise's problems with characterization. Base conversations, in short, let characters comment on developments in the story even if you are not using them enough to unlock their supports. This makes characters like Jill far better than they normally would be, because you don't have to use her to witness her arc about overcoming racism. Later games do let you talk to characters in the base, but it's never as in-depth as these base conversations. They're almost supports except not supports. And it is something I wish later games would bring back. Another thing of that note, bonus experience. This mechanic is incredible. For completing secondary objectives in maps, like sometimes rescuing villagers, sometimes beating maps quickly, sometimes keeping alive specific enemies who, are, who have been coerced into fighting, which adds a great amount of gameplay and story integration, rewards you with extra experience points that you can spend to level up characters at the base. This is a solution to characters falling behind in levels, it also lets people who join weaker easily catch up, and it lets you focus your favoritism on whoever you want. In general, I think it's a really great system that I'd love to see return. Come to think of it, Path of Radiance was also the first game to introduce forging. It wasn't as in-depth as later games, but it's still a mechanic that's stuck since then. And now, story. I'm going to rank Path of Radiance at the top. Path of Radiance is, in my opinion, the best simple story of any Fire Emblem game. At its core, it's all about an exiled royal trying to reclaim their homeland from an evil invading nation. Here's the twist though, you're not playing as the exiled royal, you're playing as a commoner hired as her bodyguard, and that changes the perspective on the story a lot. It's carried by some excellent characters, both heroes and villains. In fact, the Tellius games have my favourite cast of characters in the entire series, and Path of Radiance's characterization was so good that I love its characters even in Radiant Dawn which lacks supports. Ike also is a fantastic character. Forget everything you've been told about him in spin-offs and Smash Brothers, where he's just a big dumb strong guy. Ike has an excellent coming of age story in Path of Radiance. Going from a young, naive mercenary to somebody who leads a whole army, albeit reluctantly, and seeing more and more of the world and coming to understand its prejudices, politics, ah, just I love Ike so much. And spin-offs did not do his character justice until Engage. Path of the Radiance also has my favourite scripted character death in the whole franchise. This character was alive just long enough to endear the player to them, but not so long that their death felt like wasted potential, and the death scene itself is handled incredibly well, their death has an impact on the whole rest of the game. It's just the mould that all later games that kill off characters should follow. And now, on to Path of Radiance's sequel, Radiant Dawn, and here's where I have another hot take, because, uh, Radiant Dawn is kinda my favourite Fire Emblem game. The more I think about it, the more I realise that this is true. So I'm gonna rank Radiant Dawn up here. Maybe a little lower than FE6 on the gameplay scale, because objectively it's not quite as good, but... 
Uh, you know what? Subjectively, I do enjoy this game a lot more, so I'm going to put this over here. So, why do I like Wedding Dawn so much? Well, it's very hard for me to describe in such a short amount of time. I've done a full playthrough of Wedding Dawn on my channel, and I've gone into why I like the game at length in those videos. But in short, this game has a very epic feel. A lot of people don't like the maps with massive numbers of enemies. I'm okay with it because the battle animations are actually a lot faster and snappier than Path of Radiance. They're also kind of decent looking for what they are. I disagree with a lot of early reviews that said its graphics were bad. And yes, Radiant Dawn does have a lot of weird jank and character imbalance. There's over 70 playable characters, and there are some who are almost worthless, and I will say they completely ruined the Lagoos mechanic since Path of Radiance. Pretty much the only reliable ones are Volug because of Part 1 utility, and the Royals because they ignore the main mechanics. But elements like the bonus experience system do help ensure that any character you want to use can be viable. And I really like the split party system, as it forces you to use a lot of characters over the course of one run. It also, to me, adds to replay value, because deciding on your endgame party in advance dramatically affects how the rest of the parts feel. For example, say you want to use a lot of the Crimean Royal Knights in endgame. Suddenly, Part 2 becomes a lot more important, as well as the few chapters in Part 3 where you play as the Knights, and the Grail Mercenaries chapters in Part 3 might be a little less important when it comes to resources. Those chapters will be spent acquiring items and skills to transfer over to the Royal Knights. Speaking of which, the skill system. Being able to freely remove and swap skills around, which is something you could not do in Path of Radiance, also adds the replay value, but my favourite aspect by far is blessed weapons. In the endgame chapters, every character you've brought gets to choose one weapon to have blessed. This weapon gains infinite durability and the ability to damage the final bosses. And it doesn't have to be a legendary weapon. You can do really cool things like bless a long-range tome, like bolting, to have infinite uses on that, or bless a brave weapon. If you bring multiple characters with the same weapon type to endgame, the bless weapon system ensures they don't play identically. And thanks to this and other mechanics in the game, I describe Radiant Dawn as a Fire Emblem game where anyone you want can be a legendary hero. Heck, my comment section memed Aaron into Endgame when I played. But now, story. I do personally like Radiant Dawn's story more than a lot of people in the fandom do. But from a pure objective standpoint, I'm gonna have to put it only around, uh, upper mid-tier. Because yes, I will admit, objectively, this story is not as good as, um, as Path of Radiance. The main issues are the Blood Pact being a really awkward plot point. Uh, fun fact, it was actually significantly rewritten in the English localization, and it's still pretty bad. Part 2 is also a little filler-ish, and Part 3 falls apart towards the final portion. Meanwhile, Part 4's story, apart from Endgame, is just kinda average. And Part 1 is okay, but Micaiah's characterization didn't really hit its stride until spin-offs, she's kind of the opposite of Ike. The reason I rank Radiant Dawn decently high is, it does do some things better than other games. Chiefly, the war between the Laguz Alliance and Bednion in Part 3, at least the first half of it, is one of the few Fire Emblem wars that actually feels like a real war. You've got people discussing tactics, flanking, damaging supply lines, even negotiating peace talks. It's something you don't really see in later games where the war mostly boils down to your army goes here and captures this location. Repeat next chapter. And yes, a few of the reveals built up in Path of Radiance had kinda disappointing payoffs, but overall I still enjoyed Radiant Dawn's story, but I have to rank it a little bit lower for its issues. And so now, okay, next game is Shadow Dragon. Shadow Dragon is another game that I don't have a lot of experience with currently. I'd probably reevaluate it on a replay, but right now I rank it around here in terms of gameplay. Shadow Dragon is interesting and in it can be as easy or as hard as you want it to be. And on its lowest difficulty, it is kind of a joke, but on its highest, it's ridiculous to the point where the early game bandit bosses are the hardest in the game. 
The reclassing system is something I originally disliked for ruining the individuality of characters, quote unquote, but I've come to appreciate it a lot more now. The enemy variety is not great, the original game was not balanced around weapon triangle existing, and also especially not balanced around the wing spear existing because of the sheer number of enemy cavalry, but the actual map design is surprisingly solid. One thing I like about Shadow Dragon is the way that it handles its formulas. I used to hate them nerfing evasion, but now that I think about it, it makes raw defense a lot more valuable. It says something that General Sedka is considered a viable option at high tier play. On a negative note though, it keeps the stupidly broken warp from the original. Again, I'm not the biggest authority on Shadow Dragon gameplay, but I do enjoy it. As for story though, I'm going to rank this around the middle right up near Radiant Dawn, maybe slightly higher than Radiant Dawn. The reason for this is that even though its story is simple, even though it's mostly the same as the original, and even though there are no supports and therefore most of the characters say nothing unless they die, what little dialogue there is, is excellent. 8.4 did an incredible job on the localization in this game, making it sound almost like flowery Elizabethan English at times, and it really gives the game the feel of an actual medieval epic. Marth's character is also handled very well here. A lot of people say it's their favorite take on Marth. He's still overall an idealist, but he has just the right amount of pragmatism and edge to him. Similarly, the villains for what they are are kind of solid. Garnef is characterized very well for what seems to be a generic evil sorcerer, as is Medius, even though he doesn't get much screen time. Shadow Dragon is very similar to Path of Radiance to me, a simple story but polished very well. The reason why it can't be higher is because really only Marth has characterization. Like, this is kind of Epi6's story concept done right, in my opinion. And now we have a new Mystery of the Emblem, which never got released outside Japan, which is a shame, because in terms of gameplay, I rank it about... I'd say here. So new Mystery of the Emblem is pretty much the same as Shadow Dragon, but it fixes a lot of Shadow Dragon's balance issues with its classes and with its weapons, and it adds a very fun new mode in Lunatic Reverse, which essentially gives every enemy vantage. Lunatic Reverse increases the viability of bow classes a lot, and really changes how you play the game. But even outside of it, I think this game has probably the best difficulty balancing in the whole series. Normal mode is incredibly easy because enemy base stats aren't adjusted from the original, while yours can go above 20. The harder difficulties I feel are just right, there's a Maniac difficulty that's a little below Lunatic, and then there's Lunatic which is tough but actually quite fair. My main issue with this game gameplay wise is the existence of the Free Silvers characters. These are characters who join after the Sable Knights, and have base stats that are only balanced for normal mode enemies, and so they're pretty much worthless on anything higher, even though their growths are good, and only exist to give you extra silver weapons, hence the name Free Silvers. There are a lot of these characters, by the way. But in terms of story, I'm going to put this up a little here. So okay then. It's become cool to hate on this game's story lately, mostly because of Chris. They are the first Avatar, and therefore they get a lot of bashing from people who hate the modern Avatar system. The thing is though, Chris is inoffensive to me, because unlike later Avatars, they do not have a big role in the story. Really, objectively speaking, the only thing of note Chris does is recruit Katarina, and that's a subplot that is entirely based around Chris that is totally separate to the main plot. A lot of people accuse Chris of upstaging characters like Marth and Jagan. The only time I think they do that is in the final chapter, where they're the one to advocate for saving the brainwashed clerics. This game has a support system, but since most of its supports rely on Chris, it's not amazing. Still, it does add some nice development to characters like Warren or Dolph, who barely got any dialogue in Shadow Dragon or Mystery. And next we come to the game that changed the franchise forever, Fire Emblem Awakening. And this is interesting because my ranking for it is very similar to Fire Emblem 7, except mirrored. For gameplay, I'm going to put Awakening right here, 
right on the cusp of the good gameplay end. So, the main problem with Awakening is it's a game that is very easy to break. Without even trying, you will break this game into a million tiny pieces, and I think that's because you have access to so many busted mechanics that the enemy does not. Specifically, pair up. The fact that enemies can't use pair up and it's such a powerful mechanic already just slants the game horribly in the player's favor, and it means that even though enemy stats aren't that low in the end game, they are still vastly outclipsed by your army. You also have access to broken child units and hilarious skill combinations like Vengeance Nosferatu tanking. Oh, and uh, very readily buyable rescue staffs, shops that can easily sell reclass items that reset your level without resetting your stats very much. Yeah, Awakening is a very busted game, but it's a very fun one as well. It's probably my favourite sandbox fire emblem, especially since the world map has a lot of polish. And there's a lot of things to do outside of the main story, like street pass battles, spot pass battles, it's got some pretty nice DLC too. And so for story. Yeah, like I said, mirrored version of Fire Emblem 7. I rank this game's story as very slightly below average. But I will say one thing. The Plegia arc, that is chapters 1 to 11, is unironically peak fiction. It is my favourite opening story arc of any Fire Emblem game, and that's really saying something. I always have so much joy replaying these chapters. And then the Valmark happens and you have 10 chapters of filler! This is the main reason I rank Awakening Story where it is. It's not a horrible story, but I just can't forgive there being that many chapters of filler in a row. The Valmark and Walhart are only very loosely related to the rest of the plots. And speaking of the rest of the plot, the third and final arc is uh, better than Valm, but still not great to me. And I think it's because of two things. One, Valadar and Grima are not great villains. Grima got fleshed out in spin-offs, but I'm ranking him based on his original appearance here. Secondly, the third arc is really Robin's story, and I'm sorry, but I never cared for Robin much. As an avatar, they felt a little too much like a proxy for the player, and less like a character who actually exists in the story. Their personality is very generic, making it hard for me to get attached to them. And again, they are the focal character of the final arc, and I personally found Krom more interesting, so I didn't like him getting upstage there. The characters are... okay. They're memorable, but I am gonna give the cliché complaint that most of them revolve around one big personality quirk, and just jokes about that constantly. I also have some issues with this game's localization, and I know that's a very hot take, but it actually exaggerated some of the characters more, especially Sumia. She's actually way better in the Japanese script. The English script has her going on and on about cooking and pies when she didn't in the Japanese version, and you've got other weird choices like Walhart becoming a violently abusive father in his supports with Morgan when he was not one in Japanese. There are a lot of good supports, the main problem is the sheer number of them makes it easy for them to get lost. And speaking of which, not all S supports are created equal. I do like the fact they wanted to do Genealogy's marriage system, but give every pairing actual dialogue, and I admire them for that, but it means they had to write a romantic support for every single combination of male-female characters, and many of them just don't make sense as couples. It's funny, Krom and Sumia are the only two who have restricted marriage options, and they're the ones who have the best S supports, I feel. So that's my overall ranking on Awakening. A little below my standards for a good story, but still enjoyable. Oh boy though, speaking of below my standards for a good story, now we come to Fire Emblem Fates, and uh, these are pretty much the only games that are going to end up in the bad gameplay, bad story quadrant. At least some of them. So first, Birthright. Now, this is also going to be a bit of a weird hot take, because objectively speaking, Birthright should be like about here. But subjectively speaking, I have to rank Birthright around here, and here's why. 
Birthright's gameplay is an objectively better version of Awakening. Enemies can actually use pair up now, reclassing is not as broken, and the second generation characters are much less overpowered. Here's the thing though, its map design and difficulty curve are still very similar to Awakening, but its presentation, polish, and especially its world map, I don't find as interesting. The reason why Birthright ranks low for me on the gameplay scale is everything it offers, I would rather play a different game for. If I want the true Fates gameplay experience, I'll play Conquest. If I want a fun sandbox, I'll play Awakening. Which leaves Birthright with not much leg to stand on. Especially considering that in terms of story, Birthright goes about here. So okay then. Most people call Birthright's story the least bad of the three Fates games. But I enjoy it the least of the three. Because to me, its story is boring at best, and just as bad as the other two at worst. My biggest problem with the story is that they clearly knew this was the morally best route. So in order to make it more artificially grey, they threw in a bunch of very random named character deaths. I know that one of the deaths in Conquest is even worse, but like, so many characters in Birthright just randomly die, and it just gets a little silly eventually. Secondly, all the chapters between Light Scatters and Arriving in Nor feel a bit like filler to me. They're really just, Corrin's army goes from point A to point B while we find an excuse for there to be a battle here. Apart from the Wolfskin chapter, and that's maybe for all the wrong reasons thanks to Kaze, none of these chapters feel very memorable. Like the one where you just have to get medicine because someone is sick. I can't forget who's sick. I think it's Takumi? And that should say something. There's not much else I can say about Birthright, so on to Conquest, and obviously I rank Conquest all the way up towards the top end of the gameplay scale. Not quite at, the, quite at the end, but this is just a personal bias issue, because I freely admit I don't get Conquest meta, and Conquest meta gives me major decision paralysis. Here's the thing, the map design is absolutely fantastic in Conquest, easily some of the best in the series. The stats on enemies are also very well done, and I like the fact that Lunatic does not change enemy stats from hard. All it does is add more enemies, and give enemies more skills. But like, for example, they might add an Entrap Staff enemy to a point in the map where they otherwise wouldn't be, and that completely changes how you play. Also, the character balance is incredible for such a hard game. My only real complaint is that Camilla is too good, but it's amazing they managed to make everyone else viable. The main issue I have is the sheer amount of effort it takes to build characters in this game, and how much of it needs to be planned out in advance. In order to get the skills and classes you want, you need to plan all of your pairings, and how you level the characters, and like when to reclass them, and when to promote them, in advance. Before you even start playing, for your entire army. And I have two problems with this. One, Whenever I play Conquest, I often get up to about chapter 20, and only then do I realise that my builds are bad and not good enough to get me through chapter 25. And what do I do? All I can do is restart the game from the beginning, and that's not fun. Secondly, while I do prefer gameplay to story in Fire Emblem, I do like to have freedom in what pairings I make. And the fact that pairings are a big part of gameplay in Conquest does hurt my enjoyment a little. Yes, there are objectively better pairings in Awakening, but Awakening's children system is very much a case of when everyone's broken, no one is. No matter what pairings you make, the children will always be disgustingly overpowered. In Conquest, that is very much not the case, and the fact that some of my personal favourite ships end up unviable from a gameplay standpoint hurts my enjoyment. But still, it is the absolute peak of the franchise in terms of gameplay. Well, maybe not for me, because one of my other issues is I do think it's a little too hard and unforgiving for newcomers. As for story, I'm gonna rank the story... 
right down about the same as Birthright, to be honest. So most would rank Conquest all the way down here. I rank Conquest maybe a tiny bit higher than Birthright, and that's only because of one thing. I find Conquest Story to be so bad it's good. Yes, it is incredibly stupid, but it's entertainingly stupid, whereas Birthright is just so stupid it's boring. Garon in particular is one of my favourite characters who I like for all the wrong reasons. He's such a terrible villain that it wraps around to being really entertaining. Though I will say, Hans and Iago are awful. That's one of my biggest complaints with Conquest. They stay alive for way too long. You should have killed them at least a third of the way through the plot. Speaking of which, the first third of Conquest is mostly filler. It's basically Corrin goes somewhere on Garen's orders and then does something to fulfill the orders without actually fulfilling them. It's not until the invasion of Hoshido that things get interesting, and yes, it happens for really stupid reasons, but at least all of the invasion of Hoshido chapters feel like they exist for a reason, except maybe the Eternal Stairway. I still have fun in those maps, even though the story is stupid, just because of how stupid the story is, and because of how fun those maps are gameplay-wise. So overall, I put Conquest there. And now we come to Revelation. Oh boy. So, gameplay, I'm gonna put you... Yeah, definitely worse than Echoes. So, okay. Revelation. Not only are a lot of the maps really gimmicky and dumb, the biggest reason why I put it here is the absolutely horrendous character balance, which is even more jarring when Conquests was so good. In Revelation, many characters cannot even damage enemies in their join chapter. And these aren't even trainees either. They're meant to be normal army members like Hana, Subaki, Odin, and Laszlo. This is just unforgivable for a Fire Emblem, honestly. And story-wise, well, I think you all know where this is going. I do dislike Birthright more, but I will rank Revelation a little lower, just because I feel it is objectively worse than Birthright's story. I am not opposed to the idea of a happy ending to Fates' plot, and I'm not opposed to the idea of both kingdoms uniting against the true villain. The problem is, this plot relies heavily on one of the dumbest points in the game, the Vala Curse. Clearly, they couldn't have come up with a better reason for there to be conflict for the first half, besides Corrin and Azura literally being unable to talk about the real villains. Not only that, but the more you think about it, the more you realise all of Vala's world building, including the main villain, only exists to justify Corrin not being blood related to the Hoshiden royals, and therefore being able to marry them. So, not much else to say, Revelation is landing itself here. The thing is though, despite it appearing to be like my objectively worst Fire Emblem in terms of ranking, I still actually quite enjoy Revelation. I like being able to form parties of characters from both games, and I like seeing cross-root supports. Now next would technically be Heroes, but that plays very differently to the rest of the game, so I'm going to skip that for now. Instead, it's already time for Three Houses. So okay then. Oh, uh, this is where I'm going to be annoying a lot of people, but gameplay-wise, I have to put you about here. Three Houses is, and I really hate using this cliche, but at least in my opinion, it's a good game, but not a good Fire Emblem game. The biggest problem I have with it, well actually, it mostly boils down to two big problems. The first is that the map design is not great. There are a few chapters, admittedly, like Chapter 8, that are alright and have a good variety of sub-objectives, but most maps in Three Houses were never particularly memorable. They were just big slugfests where you throw your characters at the enemy and watch them die. And what's worse is many of these maps are reused across the routes. Even the most unique route has like one truly unique map. 
and it's kind of sad that only Verdant Wind has a non-reused map for its final chapter. But the second big issue I have is the Monastery. When I first heard reports that people were taking on average 80 hours to finish their first route of this game, I was incredulous. Then I played through my first route and took about 80 hours. And the thing is, most of those hours were not spent on the battlefield. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the gameplay is 80% monastery. And you'd think I'd enjoy this because I play Fire Emblem to watch characters grow. I enjoy building characters up from nothing. The problem is, I like doing that on the battlefield in conjunction with fun strategic map design. Not sitting at a base watching menus and stat bars fill up. The monastery I feel would not be so bad if the game only had one route. But in a game you have to play through four times to fully understand the story and world building, it gets very draining after a while. Here's how my run of three houses went. I played through the Azure Moon, Crimson Flower, and Silver Snow routes all pretty much back to back the first few months after it came out. Then I started a run of Verdant Wind on Maddening, got halfway through, burnt out hard, and I have never touched the game since. And unfortunately, I have no real desire to anytime soon. But now, story. I'm gonna rank three houses... I think about... here. Maybe about equal to Sacred Stones. So you might be wondering why it's not all the way at the top. Here's the thing. Three Houses characters are, I think, the best written characters in the entire series. And the Azure Moon route is the best story in the entire series. The problem is the other three routes. They don't even come close to Azure Moon. And let's just say, I don't think it's a coincidence that the most highly regarded Roots is also the one that focuses the least on the backstory and those who slither in the dark. One other thing as well, and this is probably a hot take, but even though I really like the characters, there aren't a lot of individual support conversations that stick out in my mind. I like the characters' supports as a whole, they're just less memorable individually. I also fully admit I'm not a big fan of grey morality and ideological conflicts. I see enough of that in real life, and mostly play fiction to escape that. I'm glad this game succeeded at being a morally debatable story, but those just aren't the kind of stories that I personally enjoy. And unless we're counting spin-offs, Wow, we're all the way up to Fire Emblem Engage. So, Engage. This may be recency bias, but gameplay-wise I'm going to put Engage all the way up at the very top. Engage was the Fire Emblem that I always wanted. Gameplay as, well, engaging as Conquest, but not as difficult. I think the difficulty levels here are pretty decent. If anything, Maddening is a little easy by Maddening standards, but I kind of enjoy that. Fire Emblem Engage has some really excellent map design. The maps are also, for the most part, quite short too, but they feel very action-packed. There's not much wasted space, there's a good variety of secondary objectives, and in particular, although there are some classes that are better than others, the class balance is a lot better than some other games. In particular, mages are almost necessary for dealing with enemy armor knights as our effective weapons, Armored classes also have their uses. Wyvern Lord is good, but there are reasons to use other classes. Both offensive and support classes have their place. I also like how every class only has one skill, and that skill isn't transferable. It eliminates some of the decision paralysis I get from other reclassing games, and it also means that if I'm using a character in a class, it's because I want them in that class. Not because I'm just being a brigand for Deathblow. This game also fixed Fire Emblem's problem with boss fights. By giving even human bosses multiple health bars, these actually feel like real boss fights now. 
and it makes mechanics like chain attacks really, really useful. Now I have a couple of gripes with character balance, some of the early joining characters fall behind, and then Kagetsu is a bit too good. But overall, everyone feels viable and engaged, and the emblem mechanic especially enhances a lot of this, because what the developers said in interviews is they wanted the kind of customization you get from the children's system without locking the player into irreversible choices. If you don't like an emblem combination, just give that emblem to someone else next chapter. What I also love is that a lot of emblems have multiple uses. Lin is a fantastic example. She is great for turning covert units into walking ballistas. She can be useful on magic users for boss killing potential with a shining bow. She can apply draconic hex to enemies from long distances. And her Call Doubles ability is decently useful on armoured units, because those doubles can sometimes be invincible to physical enemies. That's just one emblem, and that's not even getting into her skill inheritance. I also like that they've gone back to more staggered recruitments, characters joining over the course of the game rather than all being front-loaded at the start, and the fact that you can't use everyone in a single playthrough, which makes later playthroughs feel unique. And now story. This might also be a bit of recency bias and a bit of a hot take, but I'm going to put its story up about here. So, a little around Fire in fact it's probably a little above uh, Blazing Sword actually, uh, as like, very slightly above average. Yes, Fire Emblem Engage's story is very simple, but it knows what it is and isn't ashamed of it. I think the problem I have with Fates is that it tries to take itself too seriously and is oblivious to how silly it is on a conceptual level. Engage at least embraces the tropiness and silliness, but despite that, it's not a totally light-hearted story. It does go into some more serious topics like parental abuse, and people actually do die. I think though it is carried by a leer. Alir is one of the best protagonists in the series in my opinion, and easily the best avatar. They have excellent voice acting, are fully voiced even in support, yes I know Shez was first but I haven't played Free Hopes yet. They have actual character flaws that are relevant to the main plot, and even the whole divine dragon worship thing I didn't feel was that bad, because most characters drop it once they get to know Alir as a person. I was not expecting to like Alir at all, and they ended up one of my favourites. And a lot of story moments that I feel would otherwise be really silly, such as the ending of Chapter 3, end up working better than they have any rights to just because of how good Alir is. And yes, Sombron is a fairly generic bad guy, but his abusive father angle at least makes him a bit more unique than some of the other evil dragons in the series, so yeah, he elevates the story a bit for me too. My main issues with the story are the ending of chapter 23, where even one of the villains admits they're doing something that makes no sense, most of chapter 24 for being kind of contrived, and the fact that you basically fight the four hounds exclusively from chapter 14 to chapter 23. And the four hounds themselves, they're not amazing as characters, I think they tried too hard to make them sympathetic, when I think they should have gone for a less is more approach, like Advance Wars' as Black Hole Commanders. And so we come to the end of my ranking for all of the mainline Fire Emblem games in story and gameplay. I guess I can do a couple of spin-offs, just be warned that my rankings for these aren't going to be as solidified, because of a few reasons. So first, heroes. I am very, very unversed in the hero's meta, and its gameplay is borderline incomprehensible to me. It doesn't help that I boycotted skill inheritance from the moment it was introduced. To me, it ruins the individuality of characters and makes the game too complicated. I'd rather play with people's base kits. So again, I am in no position to judge its gameplay. But I guess I can kind of put it like... Here, I suppose? That's my best ranking. As far as story goes, I think about here is also right. Just because 
At first, I thought its story was very good, but bear in mind, when Heroes first released, the most recent Fire Emblem game was Fates. And I also fell out of the story after Chapter 3. Chapter 3 was kinda cool, I'll admit, and I did enjoy Chapter 5, but I haven't played anything beyond that, and from what I've heard about Chapter 7, it just sounds completely ridiculous. Uh, BS Fire Emblem. I've only played this via the remake in New Mystery of the Emblem, but I guess gameplay-wise I'll also put it like, uh, I suppose around here. Some of the maps can be a bit annoying, but overall it's alright. And story-wise, I don't know, maybe like here-ish? Or like here? It's hard to tell. All the maps have very different stories, and they range from average to okay. So I suppose it'll end up around there, but again, this is just a very tentative thing. The final spin-off, because I haven't played either of the Warriors games, is Tokyo Mirage Sessions, and I'd probably rank that about... here, I guess? Its gameplay is really solid, although very much not a Fire Emblem game. It's kind of like, I would say, Strange Journey meets Digital Devil Saga, and uh, those are both very good Shin Megami Tensei games. With some Fire Emblem mechanics, really the only Fire Emblem influences are the Weapon Triangle. As for its story, some might honestly consider it similar to Engage, but really, I found the characters in, in Tokyo Mirage Sessions a lot less interesting. And overall, I just felt like the game didn't even have much of a plot. I still enjoyed it, but mostly for the gameplay. And so, we've reached the end of my rankings, and now for some final thoughts. You might notice that uh, I've put a lot more games in the good story, good gameplay quadrant than you may expect. I honestly feel most Fire Emblem games do end up in that range. You might also notice though that I have nothing in the very top corner of perfect story and perfect gameplay. I don't think Fire Emblem has produced an entry like that just yet. I've said it many times, but my ideal would be a story like Azure Moon and gameplay like Engage. Meanwhile, I didn't put many games in the bad story, bad gameplay section, which is, which is a good thing. Fire Emblem is a high quality series for the most part. And even then, as I said, I still enjoy Revelation and sometimes Birthright. Finally, I want to note that every game that ended up on the right hand side of this chart, that is, the good gameplay section, these are all games that I very much see myself replaying someday. Everything on the left hand side though, these are games I'm less inclined to replay, and that shows the kind of Fire Emblem fan I am. I play Fire Emblem for the gameplay, story and characters are just a bonus. And with that, I will leave you. What do you think about the story and gameplay of your favourite Fire Emblem games? Does your list differ from mine? I'd like to hear in the comments. And be sure to join me for more Fire Emblem content in the future.